Cheryl. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Cheryl Aiki. I am the Director of Travel and Meeting Planning for GCFA. And we're really excited um, about the number of people that were interested to learn about meeting planning. Um, that's something that we are passionate about here and, and do quite a bit of and would love to be able to share any tidbits or, or um, <clears throat> budget help that we might could provide to you when you're planning your meetings as well. Okay, and my name is Fiona Lipscomb. I recognize some of the, na the names on the screen. Um, so you may or may not have worked with us at some point uh, during the course of your meeting planning, but um, please know that we're always here to answer questions and what have you. So um, just moving on to the first slide, and Corey's in the background advancing the slides. Just a little overview of who we are. Um, so we are a shared, department of the Shared Services Division within GCFA, um, <clears throat> based here in Nashville. And we um, have a staff with collectively over 75 years of travel and meeting planning experience. That makes um, both Cheryl and I feel very old but because um, we have the majority of it. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so we've got extensive experience in travel and meeting planning, um, both on a domestic and an international level. So we do several meetings both internationally, well, many meetings internationally as well as domestically. Um, within the department, we have three meeting planners. That's myself, um, Lauren Ashley, and then Jeanette Foster. And each of them is typically assigned, um, you know, a, a client to work with. So you basically have that, you know, one-stop shopping experience. You will have a dedicated meeting planner um, during the course of this day, uh, your time. We also have visa support services available as well, which probably for your meetings you may not need. I'm not sure whether you have international attendees flying into the United States, but sometimes visas do come up in question. Uh, we have an audiovisual specialist, Corey, who's actually running this slideshow right now. Um, so if you have any audiovisual questions, you're welcome to reach out to him. And then we also have access to an online registration portal called eTouches. Uh, some of you may already be using it, but that's um, typically what we use for our registration, uh, our uh, registration website. So uh, moving on to the next slide. So what we do uh, within Travel and Meeting Planning, this is very much of an abbreviated um, slide because we, um, we do a lot. Meeting planning, is, and as you all know, is, is not something very simple. There's a lot of complexities involved. Uh, we will assist with the initial site and venue selection. We do contract negotiation with the hotels and colleges and convention centers. Uh, we manage uh, budgets, which I'm sure you do as well. Um, we build and develop timelines, um, which are really important to managing a program of the magnitude that you do. Uh, we build online registration sites. We provide logistical planning for everything from flights, transportation, food and beverage, audiovisual, meeting room setups, rooming lists that can go on and on and on. Uh, we also do on-site support for our meetings and then um, Post-event, we actually do uh, evaluations in the form of, you know, if you wanted to provide a survey, uh, we also do um, post-con conference calls just to talk about what worked and what didn't. Um, so that's really what we do within the travel and meeting department. Um, moving on to the next slide. And like I said, feel free to ask any questions to via the chat option. Um, this is just a little funny um, meme, I guess, which, um, you know, for all of you that are organizing annual conferences, you can probably relate to it. Um, the rule for event planning is that if it seems easy, you're doing it wrong, which is certainly the case because, um, you know, in our experience when you have people um, who ask what you do and you say that you do meeting planning and they say, oh, you're a party planner. Well, it's not quite the same <laughs> thing. There is a lot that's involved in putting on meetings, as you well know. Um, moving on to the next slide. All right, so the part of this webinar was to talk about best practices with um, travel and meeting planning and some tips that you can use when you actually manage your annual conferences year over year. <coughs> uh, 
um, the first the first part is the pre-event. And you know, this is probably the most critical part of meeting planning is um, you'll see later on in the in the slideshow where I talk about the five P's, which is proper planning prevents poor performance, which basically means that the more you plan in advance, the less likelihood you are going to have of any um, hiccups along the way. So the pre-planning part is extremely important. Um, starting from the scope of the event, this is where you will, um, and, and for those of you who do annual conferences, you obviously do it year over year, but you probably still want to you know, evaluate who your audience is, why you're putting on this event, where are you putting on this event, what is the purpose, what is the outcome that your attendees want to um, have, you know, once they, when they leave the hotel or conference center. So it's really important that you have that because every, that's really the foundation of your event. Everything else kind of spins off from there. Um, developing a timeline is really important, and within that timeline, it's always good to assign particular individuals to handle, uh, you know, certain aspects of the meeting. So, for example, I'm sure some of you um, work with committees, and, you know, working with committees is a challenge in itself because you've probably got 15, 20 people who are offering all sorts of advice and thoughts and what have you, so you've really got to kind of get them on the same page when it comes to the, um, the scope of the event and then the timeline as well. So the timeline basically is your, um, you know, step by step from possibly a year out, maybe even sometimes two years out, to literally the day of the event and even a few days later is uh, every, all the, the logistical um, components of the meeting that you've got to take care of pre and during and post. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to the budget, the budget is critical for any conference, as you well know, because nobody wants to overspend in the church, <clears throat> and we always want to make really good use of the church's funds. So the way I build my budget is um, it's very simple. You basically have revenue coming in and expenses going out and you've basically got to make sure that your expenses do not exceed your revenue. Uh, within the church, and I'm, I would imagine that it would be for most of you working on annual conferences, uh, but you certainly don't want to run at a loss. You don't want to have a huge amount of profit either. Um, so you almost want to just have a break even in your, um, in your budget, whereby you know maybe you can have a little bit of extra to put towards the next year's event, but you certainly don't want to run it off. Better. So I'm just letting Fiona know that in most of the annual conferences, you don't break even because you're in your budget, you're actually just trying to save where you can in the budget. There's little money that comes in um, for that. Okay. Because it, it works kind of like a board meeting or something here where we take for the attendees. So they okay. you would take for the attendees. Um, okay. All right. Well then, um, the, so the budget, however which way you manage your budget basically is, is up to you, but obviously it's a very important aspect of the meeting is to have a, you know, a kind of a rough calculation of what this event is going to cost. Um, be aware of things like fixed versus variable costs um, when you're planning your meeting. A fixed cost would be something like your audio visual cost, which is usually a flat rate, um, it's not going to change. Obviously, it'll change if you add audiovisual, but for the most part, it's just a flat rate. Variable costs um, are things like your food and beverage. It'll vary according to the number of people that are attending your event. So, you know, if you initially plan for 500 and then suddenly you're up to 600, that price point is going to change. Um, the registration fees, do, we, do they charge? So some of you, I'm, I'm sure, charge registration fees for gas and that type of thing. Um, so there are there is some registration fees, but it's really just to offset the cost, like you said, to break even Yeah, for those people. Uh, but the others, <laughs> like clergy and the delegates, they do not normally pay. Okay. okay. So your registration fees, if you are charging a registration fee, you just need to make sure that it covers 
you know, at least the cost of what that individual is, is attain, coming for. Um, there, and this is really an, a generic overview. I mean, I can try and apply it to specifically to annual conferences, but this is really just best practices in meeting planning. Um, so some of this may apply to you, some of this may not. Um, when it comes to additional revenue streams, um, um, we have got various places where you can go, to, and this is again something that you may or may not do. Um, sponsorships, exhibit booths, um, I'm just trying to think of a couple of, you know, additional sponsored events, um, things like that, that can actually um, bring in some additional revenue so it's not coming out of, you know, the, the church's pocket necessarily. Um, and one of the things I'll add to that is with sponsorships, one of the things that we try to do when we do events with, that include sponsorship and exhibit booths is to think of who our audience is and who might be wanting to sponsor and be there. So in your, pay, in your case, you've got churches there, so you can look at sponsors that might provide goods and services or vendors uh, to churches that might actually want to be a sponsor and an exhibit there, and that would offset the cost part of the cost of your event. Yes. Um, so that's all relating to the budget. Um, well, a portion of it. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot more that goes into managing a budget. But um, what I do when I have, and I'll give you an example, extended cabinet last year, which was in November of 2016, that was a good 800 people. Um, it was a very large budget which we managed. And, you know, we just, when I got to my fixed costs, you know, I realized that I only had X amount to work with for all my food and beverage. So at that point, I went to the hotel and I said, these are the menus that I'm looking for. This is the budget for each of the menus, the lunches and the dinners. Can your chef work up um, a specialized menu in my budget? So if you do work with hotels or convention centers or catering companies, don't take their menus at face value um, because some of the hotels do charge quite a bit, you know, in food and beverage pricing. The chef will always be able to work with your budget. That's just a little tidbit of hotel information um, that I can give you. And it certainly helps you with your budget as well. All right, moving on to the next slide. Okay. So um, again, we're still working with the pre-event because obviously, you know, that's when most of the work happens is, is prior to the event. Um, when you are looking at venue and site selection, there are now annual conferences, you may use the same um, place year over year, whatever works for you. If, it, if it's working for you now, then there's no point in, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. But if you're at a point in your, um, in your annual conference right now where you're looking for something new, whether it's because you've grown your annual conference or you um, want to move it to a different part of the state, um, then the venue and site selection is really important. Um, there's so many factors that come into this. Um, it's not a matter of just taking the map of your state and just kind of like circling and finding a place. You know, the location is important, whether it's um, close to the airport, um, the, the flights that fly into that particular airport, you know, is it a regional airport um, or is it a national airport, you know, which has more airlift? Um, the venue, you, if it's a small little one or two day meeting where people are flying in and flying out, then you typically would use an airport hotel. There's no reason to drag them all the way into the city. But for your particular events, you may want to go further out to more of a retreat center or a resort. Um, so it's really just dependent on the feel of the annual conference that you're wanting to um, create for your attendees. Um, obviously, <clears throat> whenever you go, a downtown hotel in New York City is by certainly going to be far more expensive than an airport hotel out of LaGuardia, um, a resort environment, out, you know, in Florida is going to be more expensive than, you know, a, than a retreat center or a <clears throat> university. Yeah. So, you know, when, you, when you're looking at the venue and site selection, you've also got to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, the, the pricing is going to change and vary depending on which city and state you're in. 
Um, so once you've determined that and you've kind of weighed the pros and cons for the, slide, the site, then the next thing to do is to send out a request for proposal. Um, I'm not sure if you do this, uh, but it's always good to have a couple of options and then you can weigh out you know, one option over the other, and it's also a great negotiation tool because you can turn to the one hotel that you really like and say, well, this hotel is offered this rate, can you match it or at least come down close to it? So it's a, real, it's a good negotiation tool to have more than one. We usually work with about three hotels. Um, <clears throat> so when you send out a, uh, the request for proposal, this allows you to negotiate the contracts which obviously ensure the best savings. And, um, you know, you, you would, on the next slide, I'll show you what, um, what you typically would include in an RFP. Um, very important, though, once you do have the contract and you've negotiated those hotels, make sure that your legal department or a legal eye reviews the contract because there are, you know, a couple of little clauses in those hotel contracts that can sneak in and, um, just with the way everything's going right now with, um, you know, all sorts, well, certainly, you know, I mean, just Hurricane Irma, for example, we, you know, we're already facing a situation tomorrow where we have a hotel that doesn't have power, and so one of our events is cancelling. So we're in a force majeure situation where you've got to wonder what penalties we will incur as a result of this. So it's really important that you have um, somebody from the legal department um, review your contract. Um, Corey, move, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so what is an RFP, which is a request for proposal? Um, you would typically send out uh, as soon as you have your confirmed dates or at least two date options. Um, you know, you, it's probably good to have a backup plan because you don't know whether you're in high season with that particular place. Uh, they may not have space available, so they'll come back and ask you if you have alternate dates. So um, I'm not sure whether you have your date set in stone or whether they're a little bit variable, but um, if there's a little bit of flexibility, that's always a good thing as well. And another thing to think about that is, is the pattern of dates. So yeah. when you're looking at whether it be a university, a retreat center, or something, you may ask them if a pattern of dates work better if you can be flexible with moving your conference up a day or a day later. Yeah, and to add to Cheryl's point, um, for example, you know, you might find cities who are, you know, absolutely dead, you know, over the weekends, and so a weekend pattern of Friday through Monday works great for them. Um, or you might find, you know, hotels who are more tourist destinations, let's say Orlando, for example, uh, where, you know, I mean, well, they're busy year-round, so that makes it a little bit difficult. But, you know, they they would probably uh, have higher rates on the weekends because that's typically when people would be going down there in the first place. So, yes, the arrival date and the pattern is really important. Um, you would provide them with an, uh, just information on the group and an overview of the group and your expectations. Um, obviously, the number and type of hotel rooms. So, are you all in single accommodation? Will they be in doubles, meaning two beds in the room? Are they going to be sharing? Um, do you need suite upgrades for your um, bishops or whomever might be attending? Um, it's also good to provide them with a budget for your room rates. So, obviously, you know, if if you're sending your RFP to the Ritz-Carlton, you know that you're going to have a really high rate. So it's, you know, you need to be aware of which hotels you, you want to send the bid to, knowing that they're going to, um, you know, have different varying prices. Um, it's also good to list the food and beverage events because this will typically allow the hotel to work up a food and beverage minimum. With the food and beverage minimum, um, you would typically get your meeting space complimentary. Um, each hotel is different, each hotel contract is different, so you would negotiate differently for pretty much um, every hotel. But the standard practice in the United States, and I'm generalizing, but it is 90% standard, is that if you have a food and beverage minimum and you meet that food and beverage minimum, 
then the meeting space would be complementary. Um, depending on how much meeting space you're using, they may provide you the general session room comp, um, and then you have to pay a small nominal fee for the breakout sessions. But if you are bringing a significant amount of food and beverage um, revenue to the hotel, then that's definitely a negotiation tool um, for you to use. Um, the other part of the RFP is to include um, the decision date or, you know, rather the proposal when you would like to receive the proposals back. So obviously if you have a committee meeting coming up soon and you have to make a decision before the end of September, then you want to make sure that those RFPs come in probably at least a week ahead of time. Um, it's also good to give the hotel a decision date because they may, not all of them do, but some of them may put those uh, rooms and meeting space on hold for you, um, which would be great, you know, but they're only going to hold the space for so long. So um, the other, most of the time they won't hold the space unless you actually go towards more of a definite contract. Um, you can also list your concessions. So, for example, you know, breakfast included in the room rate. We want to make sure that Wi-Fi is included in the room rate. Um, we want to make sure that there's complimentary parking. Um, what my, my rule is, don't be afraid to ask. I mean, I typically ask for the world. Probably some of the hotels <laughs> are just looking at me in disbelief. But I just put everything down and cross my fingers and see what they'll, what they'll say. And, you know, they'll usually come back and, and honor quite a bit of it. You want to add some things? No. Um, the other important thing, so obviously the concessions is what you're going to be asking for. The other important part of the contract negotiation is it, anything that's non-negotiable. So, um, you know, I feel like, for example, we typically um, stick to an 80% attrition rate which means that if you have 100 rooms, room nights, then you're obligated to at least fill 80% of those room nights up until, usually it's by the cutoff date. Um, sometimes they're very generous and they do it up to a week before and sometimes they do it to the day of check-in. Um, but it's, you know, there's certain things that we won't um, negotiate on. Um, so you can put those in. Um, being with annual conferences, you may have certain stipulations that are a make or break situation with the hotel, in which case list those and that way at least the hotel is aware. And I might add to that, if you can provide them history of your event, which you all have, uh, for the last several years it makes those type of non-negotiable non contract terms easier to negotiate with yeah. because they can see what your room, what your uh, room capacity has been for the last couple of years, what your meeting space has, what your food and beverage um, dollar amounts are. So it makes it much easier to negotiate the contract with history. Okay, and I don't see any questions coming through chat, so I'm just going to keep on going. Um, but like I said, feel free to um, send any of your questions that you might have um, over the chat feature, and then we will address them either right there and then, or we will address them um, at the end of the webinar. Um, so the next slide actually um, talks about concessions that you can, you know, you can consider. Um, for example, did you know that most hotels will offer you a one per 40 or possibly a one per 50, per 50 complimentary room? Uh, that means that for 50 rooms, and sometimes they're generous, they do 40 rooms, um, for every 50 room nights, not rooms, room nights booked, you get a complimentary room. So that actually, when you've got, well, some of your annual conferences are up to 900, you know, rooms per night, I would think, over a three or four day period, I mean, that's, that's a good chunk of change that would be credited to your master account. So if in your contract there's nothing about the one per comp room, make sure you add that in. That is one of those questions that I would ask and I would absolutely expect the hotel to deliver on that. Um, suite upgrades, you know, very often when you have large uh, conferences and you want to maybe upgrade your speakers to a suite, um, many hotels will offer you, for example, five suite upgrades 
at the room rate, at the standard room rate. So you won't be paying that suite room rate. Um, discounted staff rooms, complimentary meeting space, which we talked about, complimentary Wi-Fi. Most hotels these days, certainly in the United States, offer complimentary Wi-Fi in the hotel rooms, but that is not the case with meeting space. Um, most hotels see the Wi-Fi in meeting space as a revenue generator, and um, you'd be quite shocked to see the pricing that they charge, you know, to have Wi-Fi in the meeting rooms. So it's certainly something worth asking to have complimentary Wi-Fi in the meeting space as well. Um, hospitality suite, the waived or reduced attrition. Um, waived is, I, I've used to see a hotel that is going to waive attrition, but it's something that you can certainly ask. But certainly um, attrition, um, and I, I don't know if everybody understands how attrition works, but I'll just explain it quickly. Um, basically, you know, you would need to meet a certain obligation of the hotel block, just as I mentioned in the previous slide. If you have 100 rooms and you have an 80% attrition clause in your contract, then you're obligated to fill 80 rooms. If you fill 70 rooms, then you would be paying, you know, those 10 rooms, basically. Um, so that's what the attrition is. Uh, so um, complimentary or reduced parking, amenities, um, the no walk clause, you can add that into your um, conference, uh, into your contract, and that basically means that if the hotel, if the hotel has another group, oh gosh, I've got an incoming call. Um, if the hotel, you know, <laughs> has another group, and they, you know, kind of want to shove your group to the side and bring this other group in, they can't do that by law. They, I mean, by the contract, they can't walk your group to another facility, um, so they have to make alternative arrangements for that other group, okay? Um, the cutoff date for guest rooms, that typically is 30 days prior to your check-in date. Sometimes hotel room, hotels are a little bit more flexible and they'll do a three-week cutoff. Um, that's usually for um, rooming lists and, you know, in certain aspects, individual call-ins as well. And the reason why they have a three-week cutoff is obviously they don't want to sit on those rooms and they don't want you to sit on those rooms. And you really do want to release those rooms back into their inventory because otherwise you would be liable for attrition if you did not meet that room block. Um, group rates three days pre and post. Um, as you might be aware, I'm sure several of your attendees might want to come in a couple of days beforehand and a few days afterwards with their families or maybe have an extended vacation or something like that. So um, it's always good to um, ask for that clause for the three days pre and post event group rate. Um, resort fees, I don't know of anyone that would really use a resort, but typically a resort will charge maybe up to like $12.95 or $25 per day resort fee, which gives you access to all their amenities, you know, their pool and their spa and what have you. Um, that, if you, if you do decide to go to a resort, then that is certainly worth negotiating as well. You could probably negotiate at least to get it cut in half. And if a hotel refuses to reduce the resort fee, always ask for the room rate to be reduced by the amount of the resort fee because a lot of times they're able to do that in mm -hmm. lieu of reducing the resort fee. Yeah. Um, food and beverage, you know, sometimes um, hotels will offer, you know, a complimentary reception, you know, welcome reception for your guests, or they will um, do a 10% discount on food and beverage as long as the food and beverage minimum is met. Uh, so that's something worth considering as well. Um, and audiovisual. Most hotels, if you use their in-house audiovisual, uh, then they're willing to, you know, give you a ten percent or I mean I've had twenty percent discount on audiovisual. But that's only if you use their in-house audiovisual. Uh if you choose to bring in an outside audiovisual company, then they're not gonna even consider, you know, making any concessions there. Uh Complimentary airport transportation, if you um, are in need of a shuttle to go back and forth, that might be something that you could work in as well. 
And then um, also the food and beverage minimum. You know, a hotel may come to you and say, oh, you know, we want uh, a $100,000 food and beverage minimum. And when you do your budget, you know, you may realize that you're only going to be able to reach 75000 So, you know, it's, it's definitely worth negotiating and just make sure that it's in line with your budget, the food and beverage minimum. Otherwise, you'll be ordering very, very expensive meals for your attendees <laughs> to make up for it. Okay, moving on to the next slide. This is what I was saying. Proper planning prevents poor performance. So the more you do in advance, um, the better it will be for the on-site event. So if we move it about to the next slide. All right, so um, the best practices, so I've touched on, well, that was probably, um, you know, the, the probably two-thirds of the webinar is the, is the pre-planning, which is very, very important. Um, obviously, during that time, you know, you would have built your registration site, and we're going to talk, touch on that as well. Um, but the more you, you plan in advance, the better. So now we're leading up to the event and also the on-site. So um, you would obviously need to submit your rooming list by the cutoff date to ensure uh, no attrition. Um, it's important that you provide the hotel with your VIP list, your on-site contact or contacts, and also your authorized signatories. Um, those are the people that would be authorized to sign to the master account. Um, your food and beverage, make sure that you provide your final guarantee 72 hours prior. That's a typical hotel um, policy. Retreat centers may be a little different. Uh, convention centers, I doubt it. It's usually a 72 hour prior period. And if it's over a weekend, if your meeting actually starts on the Monday, then the weekend doesn't count. It would need to be provided the Wednesday beforehand. Um, so. Your final guarantees are what the hotel or the convention center is going to charge you. So if you submit a guarantee of 800 people and only 650 people actually show up and have the meal, then you will be billed for 800 people. And the reason for that is because by that stage, the hotel's gone and ordered all the food, you know, they've got all the labor in place and what have you. So they would incur, you know, some significant costs as well. Um, so it's really just a protective measure of, um, you know, protecting the hotel as well. Um, the pre-con meeting, I'm not sure, I'm hoping that all of you do have a pre-con meeting at the facility that you use for your annual conferences. If you don't, I would certainly recommend adding it um, to your um, best practices. The pre-con meeting is usually held about a day before your big arrival. And it's really just a meeting where everybody gets on the same page so that the hotel works closely with you and vice versa. Um, but you would have an opportunity to meet the key staff in the hotel um, or convention center wherever you actually use, you know, host your annual conference. Um, it's just great to um, get the names and contacts of um, the reservations manager, the front desk manager, the food and beverage, the banquet staff, the banquet captain, um, you know, everybody who's going to play a key role in making sure that your event is a success. Um, it's also a good time to go over the rooming list because inevitably there'll be some last minute changes, cancellations, you know, and what have you. So that's a good time to review the rooming list, and to also go over the BEOs, which is the banquet event orders. That's the day-by-day -day, um, uh, kind of uh, planning document that the hotel uses to make sure that your event runs smoothly. Um, I've got a sample of, our, of it on the next page. Uh, also a good time to talk about dietary requests. Um, if you do do online registration or even paper registration, it's always really important to ask that question uh, about dietary requests and certainly ADA, um, you know, disabilities. Translation services, I doubt, I don't think many might use translation, but that's another option. And then also security needs. We have several groups that um, require additional security. So it's always important to alert the hotel um, 
make sure that they provide their emergency um, procedure and just make, you know, put them on standby for um, any security issues that may arrive as a result of your group being at that, uh, on those premises. Um, we, on site, one of my standard practices is, you know, I wake up bright and early on the morning of the event and go walk the space and make sure that everything is in place. The tables are set up the way that you want things set up. The audio visual is working. Um, as you know, if you don't have a good audio visual presentation, then you really don't have a good conference. That is like critical to uh, a successful event is that your production is flawless. Um, it's always good to have a um, an updated registration list at your registration desk to show um, all the um, people that are attending your event. There might be some people who have been paid, they need to pay on site, you know, make sure you have all that um, information readily available. And then obviously, as you're well aware, you know, all the planning in the world can't prepare you for the last minute, you know, little troubleshooting that might take place. But if you've done a lot of planning, then hopefully those are to a minimal. And um, my whole philosophy is as long as the attendees don't see what I see, then I've done my job. <laughs> so, but the troubleshooting is going to happen. You're going to have some last minute changes. Um, I'll give you a, a funny example of one of the conferences that I managed um, a couple of years ago. This was before I was working for the United Methodist Church. Um, I was about to start my keynote session. It was the big reveal. It was the big opening session. And my speaker got up on stage, or the chairman, rather, of the event got up on stage. And at that point, the entire um, stage lighting went off. And we were standing in a, in a room that was completely dark. Well, it turns out that one of the banquet staff had decided that he wanted to unplug the water filter and use the outlet for something else. And he thought that he had unplugged the water filter, and he had actually unplugged my entire production uh, power. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just one of those mass pandemonium moments, which you know, hopefully I won't have to ever relive. But you know, you can always look and laugh at it about afterwards. But those things are going to happen, and you've just got to be very much on your toes to um, troubleshoot. The one other thing that I recommend doing on site is just to double check the banquet checks daily. Um, that just really alleviates a lot of um, hassle on the tail end of your event. So um, sit down with a banquet manager or with your convention services manager and review all the banquet checks daily. And you know, if there is any discre uh, discrepancies, then they can take care of those right there and then. And then finally, Corey. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that's just an example of a banquet event order. I'm sure that you've probably seen them, but it basically just gives you an overview of a day-by-day -day account of all your events that are taking place. So we can move on to the next slide, Corey. Um, and then finally, we get to the post-event best practices. Um, so just as you did a pre-con with the hotel where you talked about everything that would happen during the event, um, it's a really good idea to have a post-convention meeting with the hotel, but also with your committee or whoever's involved in the, um, the planning of the event. Um, everything will be fresh on their minds. Um, it'll be a great time for you to collect that information and put it on some form of document so that you can refer to it the next year and make sure that whatever improvements need to be made on your event can be made. Um, so. I would, I would recommend that you do it either on site or within one week after the event just to make sure that everybody still has their minds fresh and, and you can collect that information. Um, obviously, you'll review and audit any bills that come through, including the hotel and other related expenses. Um, you would provide suggestions and improvements for the next year. And then, of course, you know, we just start the big cycle again of, of looking at um, sites and venues for the following year. So that's really the, the circle of life in meeting planning. And um, at this time, I'm going to open it up for questions and answers, uh, which you can submit via the chat 
So we option. Just up and let them talk. Okay. So, um, Corey, why don't we do this? Um, if everybody, uh, Corey, can we unmute everybody? And then hopefully we can just do a one by one um, questions and answers. But I just want you to make sure now that I can hear everybody, because it was like talking into uh, a dead phone, but did everybody um, get, you know, understand that? And do you have any questions that you have for Cheryl and myself? No questions? Is it possible, I do, this is Jane Horseman from the Mississippi Conference. Is, uh -huh. it, possible, is it possible to share out the, the slides? Oh yes, absolutely, we'll be happy to do that. Um, Corey, I think, would you have uh, all the emails available? I think you would, so we'll do that I, most easily. Okay, fantastic, I'll be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I know that we didn't talk too much about online registration with this one because we were talking about best practices, but a couple of things I would like to mention about doing online registration that I think that might be helpful for you guys, and most of you I think probably do this, but make sure that you uh, capture any meal requests, any special meal needs so that you can let the hotel know ahead of time. It's also great for you to be able to capture your rooming list through online registration because that saves you a lot of time from having to do that manually. Um, at, you know, right before the conference um, of you entering anything. And so when you're thinking about doing your online registration for your event, think about any and all information that you would like to collect for them and how you would like to collect it so that it keeps you from having to do as much work um, on the back end. And Fiona just pulled the slot up um, as far as online registration and some of the best practices for that. Um, and I know that the majority of the annual conferences do use online registration. So that's just, these are a couple of the things that, that we wanted to kind of point out with that. Obviously, it going paperless, it saves you time, it saves you labor. Um, keeps you from the, the manual mistake of misspelling people's names and trying to read through handwriting if they do paper forms. Um, it can collect all of the data that you want to. It can also collect payments for you, keeping you from having to uh, handle check payments. Provides the reporting as needed. It can also send reports to uh, some of the annual conferences, do that to their day career coordinators. Um, if they're using a university, to different fields of the university that's handling different parts of their event. So you can have multiple emails going out to different people depending on what type of reports or needs that they have. Um, it can uh, promote your event and it allows you to send out mass emails uh, to your attendees um, if there's any changes or anything going on. Um, and then you, nowadays with most of the online registration softwares, um, you can do full websites. So you can create a full website for your event, including a home page with a welcome letter from your bishop, um, the agenda, important information, even some, some people put maps on there of the location that they're at, and along with just the interactive registration page. Um, and then the majority of them integrate with mobile apps, and we've noticed in the last year that a lot of annual conferences are asking for mobile apps for their attendees while they're on site so that they know where they need to be for each event and where meals are taking place and that kind of thing. And some of the examples of the big online registration platforms include eTouches, Event, Eventbrite. Um, there's several of them out there. There's, there's probably 50 or so more registration sites out there. Yes, I, I had neglected to say that I was going to um, review the online registration and didn't advance to the final slide. So this is the final slide, which um, Cheryl has given an overview of. And um, so at that time, if there are no other questions, then we'll let you have 15 minutes back of your day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so any more questions?
No. Yep. And then I'll provide to you uh, my email address, which is C A K E Y at G C F A dot O R G. And then if anybody comes up with any questions now, later, after you've had some time to think about it, email me. We're happy to help in any way. What we were really trying to talk about here was best practices and maybe come up with just a suggestion or two and that we hope that we hope that you got from this on ways that you could benefit for your annual conference and how you could save some money as well. Yes, uh, Corey, if you just advance to the final slide uh, where the Q&A logo is, that's, um, Cheryl's information is there. So caqgcfa.org and her phone number is listed there as well. So on that note, um, we will certainly send out this um, PowerPoint to everybody that was on the call. Feel free to share it with anybody in your office that you think would um, benefit from it. And, you know, like Cheryl said, we are here to answer any questions that you might have relating to putting on your annual conferences. So thank you very, very much for joining, and we wish you all a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.